Underrated is a term that gets thrown around way too liberally these days. A true underrated episode is one that's an absolute gem, but is usually overlooked by the majority of the community. And of all the Ultimate Alien episodes, the one that stands out to me the most as truly underrated is, of course, A Night to Remember. <laughs> the artist here and welcome back to another Ben 10 breakdown. This episode tackles the converging storylines between the Forever Knights and the Esoterica. So far, with the Knights, they found an ancient seal thinking it was a weapon stash, broke it open, accidentally released a mind-controlling demon, which releases a signal to the immortal Old George to retake command of the Forever Knights, upgrading their armor, and sets off on a quest to prepare for a greater war against a powerful dragon he fought long ago. With the Esoterica, they find a washed-up and weakened Vilgax, falsely believing him to be Dagon, a multi-dimensional godlike alien who supposedly jump-started humanity and will someday return to peace. The trio find out about this, but the Esoterica still stubbornly fall for all of Vilgax's ploys and use their dimensional shifting technology to put up a fight. These are two very stacked storylines that appear separate at first, but converge once it's revealed that the dragon Old George fought centuries ago was actually the Dagon in which the Esoterica worship, converging these storylines in this dramatic, action-packed, lore-heavy episode that never seems to come up in conversation anymore. Personally, I think this episode is overlooked for two reasons. For one, UA Season 3 has been an absolute messy imbalance of some pretty arc-heavy episodes, some fun filler ones, and some absolutely terrible premises, and it turned a lot of fans away from the show by now. And for two, the ending of this arc is notorious for being rushed, so even for the fans that stuck with the show, they probably don't go back to this arc often. But among the chaos this episode is a shining beacon of hope, and whether or not you like where this arc ends up going, this story ties everything together efficiently and in fascinating manners. It's a shame that this overall arc isn't that well received because it overshadows this pretty great episode. So let's take a look at it today, but first, if this is your first breakdown and you're curious about how my rating system works, there's a detailed description down below, along with a link to all my previous breakdowns, but by all means watch this video first. I'm sure you'll still enjoy it. On December 2nd, 2011, the unlikely duo of Matt Wayne and Len Uli had brought us a night to remember. After a battle with the Esoterica, the trio find out that Winston was still under possession of the Dagon. When they report this to the Knights, they set off to find Old George to see how to truly defeat this demon. Meanwhile, Vilgax prompts the Esoterica to bring them the heart of the Dagon, which was removed by George centuries ago, so that he can have more power in his endless conquest to rule the galaxy. As both of these factions are now after the same thing, things get a little shaky. So out of curiosity, I searched Scientology Barn to see if even this place could be some kind of reference to something. And I ended up finding something called The Hole, which isn't exactly a barn, but seems to serve the same kind of purpose as whatever this place is. Scientology controversies run pretty deep. Just a few crabs to feed this giant squid. At least they're animated very nicely. Look at them all wiggling and such. I need power. Only one source of such power. Your heart. Heart. He's like, oh man, now there's something else I gotta pretend to know what they're talking about. Bring it to me. We must take you to it. Man, Edwards isn't even a little suspicious this isn't Dagon. Do so at once. Small note, but I like how some of these bubbles aren't complete spheres. And they are a little bit wiggly, because that's how bubbles can be underwater. That's a good transition shot. Look at it fade into the interior. It lines up very nicely. We've come a long way from that janky rust bucket shot from the classic series. This is Surveillance Team 3. Target V is on the move. Now what the heck is this thing? This is something they'd usually use their plumber's badges for. Although this guy right here stays in the exact same position between the two shots, despite everything else changing size and proportion. What do you want us to do? That's a nice transition too, though. Lowers the glasses up to them. Don't let him escape. We're on our way. It's kind of cool to see Ben working with the extended plumbers, but I mean, imagine if these were like the plumbers helpers that we've seen the past couple of seasons. This would have been the perfect time to bring them back again. But at the same time, I also like that we're seeing plumbers outside of all of the known characters. But I don't know, I, I love the plumbers helpers. I wish they got more screen time. That could have been Alan. 
right, so last time we saw these guys, we saw that they were able to shift through dimensions. This is our first time seeing their other power, where they can create these energy spheres. I really like the look at them. Although if you look real quick, every time they strike a new solid pose, their energy stops moving. See, it's stuck on this for a few frames until they move again. Then it's still again. Like, watch it in motion again. It's in motion. It stops. Motion stop. Stuff like that happens when moving hair too. When like you're drawing an object that's supposed to be moving on top of an object that's supposed to be moving, it's hard to make sure these are two separate movements. It could be hard to maintain a sub animation on top of a dominant one. Lay down your weapons. Oh, I really like this guy's helmet. That's cool. I'll never get tired of watching them shift. Oh, shield construct. I forgot they could do that. Love those little spins he did. Man, the acrobatics on them are insane. So like right now we're still at the point where these are just volunteers willingly serving the Flamekeeper Circle rather than what they eventually become, which I'm waiting to talk about because that's a whole thing. So like this is really like them doing that. It takes a lot of skill. And that spinning roundhouse, beautiful. Wa bam! they even got the motion lines on there. I mean, the Esoterica, yeah, I, I guess they're powerful enough to do so. But it feels like the plumbers lose a lot more than they win. Unless it's the trio. That guy in the truck is not Dagon. Oh, use your heads. Why does he need a truck to get around? Silence! This guy is hardcore in denial. <laughs> Their energy spheres disperse into lightning, contrasting the usual straight beam that we see in the show. Nice reflexes. Man, all of the fights in this episode are fantastic. Look how he stops running just to throw this kick in, but still perfectly maintains his running cycle. Like it was nothing. Let me tell you something. Actually, this shot looks like it connects to this earlier shot right here. All the way back here. Ignore the pixeliness, that just happens sometimes. Yeah, it does. So I feel like this shot was animated in full right up to this part and they just added in all this extra stuff to divvy up the pacing. What's that look like if I get rid of the, the middle sequence? Yeah, I wonder like maybe if the episode ran a little short, so they threw in this sequence to lengthen it up. No complaints there though, this sequence is freaking awesome. Now we've seen how many crazy hits Wrath can take, so this blast that Edwards did to him is no joke. <laughs> I think it's smart for them to add that little chunk chunk stare sound effect to let you know they're interacting with something, just so it doesn't look like they're flying. Now that's pretty sweet. Gwen's mana is able to see through the dimensions. This probably connects to her other abilities with similar regard, like her ability to see through the spaceship without actually moving, or the fact that Ledger domains in a different dimension entirely. I think it's a later episode that confirms that mana is multi-dimensional, which gives Gwen quite the advantage, and this is a cool way to display that ability. They're climbing around on stairs in a parallel dimension. Sure. Why wouldn't you believe that, Kevin? Are you serious? Yeah, you deserve that, bro. Come on. We're on episode 140 and you're gonna draw the line at multi-dimensional stairs. Look how this guy's coming out though. Pretty much every esoterica that we've seen the past two episodes comes out at a perfectly parallel line. In fact, I did a whole thing discussing it in one of the previous breakdowns. But this guy actually is coming out at a different angle, as if the division is finally being seen from another angle and he's pushing through. So this kind of breaks all of my previous theories about it, but it's also really cool to see. But Gwen with the roundhouse kicks too. Look at that posing. All choreography in this episode, 10 out of 10. Y'all can stop a truck though. Don't let them get away. I can't really play it because of copyright, but I loved that Ben's ultimate alien theme was playing during that sequence. Whoa, what? So they can use the energy to teleport things too. In fact, I'm gonna start making a list of all of their abilities. Every now and then I check the wiki to confirm whether these abilities seem legit or not. Just because like if somebody else noticed these things, then that's additional validation. But the Esoterica wiki page, at least within the time of me uploading this breakdown, doesn't list their abilities power by power in like a detailed gallery, like most of Ben's transformations, for example, or other notable villains. So I'm gonna start collecting it myself right now in hopes to help contribute to that. So 
energy manipulation is a given. I'm gonna write energy beam. I'm sure there's like actual terminology for this, but you know, I'm just trying to gather the facts. Energy shields, dimensional shifting. I don't know what you would call walking up the stairs, but I'm gonna call it dimensional tangibility, just cause that sounds cool. There's pro again, there's probably a real name for that. And now object teleportation. So yeah, not bad so far. Missed opportunity to reuse those bombs they've shown a few times. I like technology continuity, but you know, maybe these are special Dagon bombs or whatever. Mmm, Kevin's getting rocked now though, but still the posing and everything, even the in-between seem a lot more solid than normal. This is another well animated episode. Nice job taking care of the plumbers. See, now this is chaotic enough of a scenario where I could believe the bad guys get away, especially the last episode. Sometimes the trio just really seems like they're just letting things happen or not taking the scenario seriously. Whereas here, the building's exploding. They gotta save the plumbers. Kevin's even helping a member on the enemy side. I mean, they're still in a truck though. Like, I, I do believe they can do all of this and still catch up, but you know. At least they're putting in the effort to make the chaotic escape seem legit. Like, that truck's probably just down the street by now. And Kevin's car is, like, insanely fast. Sorry about your team. It comes with the territory, Ben. We're all professionals here. It's a sad truth about this kind of mission. Sometimes that attitude is the only way to get through it. Winston? Now the Forever Knight and the Esoterica plot are starting to intertwine. Whereas if you remember the creature from beyond, Winston was one of the victims of the Lacubra alongside Gwen. But I don't think we yet know that the Lacubra is also connected to Dagon. There's a lot of different moving pieces here. <gasps> and there's those same eyes from that episode too. Although it's funny that now that Winston's mask is off, they change his proportions to be Winston's proportions, which is much shorter and scrawnier than Kevin. Whereas beforehand, he was the size of like a tall athletic male. Maybe like the mask magically changes his body too or something. That that would make sense for the later discussion I keep talking about. But I mean, all Kevin did was remove the mask and then all of a sudden Winston's body type entirely changes. You can also see right here that some of Winston's frames don't actually touch the border of the scene. How long have you been in Esoterica? You're daft. Oh, Okay, so he's one of the people that followed him without even knowing. I guess I'll just talk about it now. In the finale, we see that Dagon possesses the entire world, transforming everybody into an esoterica, but does it as if shifting into an esoterica actually transforms you into something entirely different, rather than in the debut episode of the Flamekeeper Circle, where we see it's all just people willingly following them and just putting on these costumes as is. Whereas in the finale, like their body types all change to the exact same standard esoterica shape and it all seems like they're possessed like the esoterica are their own species or whatever and i think we're starting to see that a little bit here so it's never truly explained how that works but it seems like there's two types of esoterica the ones that willingly follow and just wear the costumes and the one that are enslaved and transformed into esoterica maybe the division comes from the actual interference of dagon because edwards and everybody predate dagon's genuine return they all think vilgax is dagon and they're just rolling with it whereas when Winston was actually infected by the Lacubra, which came from Dagon, thus actually magically transforming into an esoterica, not just dressing like one. See, I told you, it's kind of weird. I must report to Sir Driscoll straight away. I wonder what this does. This kind of looks like the H.G. Wells time machine. I mean, not really, but it does enough where I would believe it's at least a reference to it, just because this arc is full of references to like old mythologies and sci-fi stories and such. So this would kind of fit into that theme. I wonder what this does. So now Driscoll's returned again, and this is Sir Cyrus, who actually wasn't at the meeting with the Forever Night Roundtable, but he was in The Creature from Beyond, which is the episode with Winston. Don't push the red button. Wow, what an emphasized transition with a sound effect. That doesn't happen often in Ben 10. Fast track! And now we finally get Fast Track named on screen, not just in merch and message boards. I wasn't a huge fan of his sound effects before, but it was probably just within like the biased comparison to Accelerate, but I kind of do like his little loopy whistles and whatnot when he moves around. I've gotten used to it. Yeah, you. And I was pretty disappointed that Fast Track was yet again only used for a few seconds just because of the curiosity of this transformation. Like the first time we got him, his whole scene was just a silent cameo. What then? He disobeyed orders. I was supposed to let the grenade get you? And now we do get a little bit more, but it's like, what was this, 10 seconds or so? 
They put his mask on just to rip it back off. He's been under the control of the dagger. Squire is a traitor. You know what to do. Oh, they would just kill him right there. No hesitation either. Although with all of their new holographic weapon spawning laser technology, they're still using this regular dagger to stab Winston. Small thing, but even the head turned looking up. That's animated very nicely, very smoothly. You remember that cave with the seal? Anyone who was near there could be under Dagon's influence. Including Gwen, right? Yes. Thank you. You are such simple creatures. This is also the first time we're hearing the real Dagon, which of course is John DiMaggio. But this is a really good voice. I, I like John as this. There is a pretender. Wow, Gwen's floating. Probably with the help from Dagon, but still proves that she can do it. You mean Vilgax. He plans to steal my heart. So if the Dagon heart is what gives him power, how is he controlling the Lacubra or even possessing Gwen? Maybe the Lacubra acts as like a power conduit to allow him to still interact with this dimension, but the heart is what allows him to do it directly. He will have power enough to rule your universe. Uses the word universe too, not just world or earth or anything. And Dagon has no reason to lie or even be like superfluous with his words. What was that? The Lacubra? That thing that came through the seal? <laughs> That's so descriptive. That reminds me of this clip in, uh, I think Marvel Future Avengers, I think it was called. And there's this one character who says something like in a similar vein with Kevin, where it's just like so overly descriptive. I, th I just thought it was hilarious and I had to clip it. Because we've arranged a meeting with Iron Fist. Really? The Iron Fist? The hero with fists of iron? That just kills me. I love it. Really? The Iron Fist? The hero with fists of iron? What was that? The Lucubra? That thing that came through the seal? A little bit of a different vibe, but like you can see the similarities, right? Also the Fists of Iron dude right here is voiced by Xander Mobus, who is the voice director for the 5YL motion comic, along with the voice of Paradox, and a few other fun surprise characters. So shoutouts to you, Xander. The Lacubra was an insect compared to, it was Dagon. So she can mentally feel the difference of the level of mind control. I wonder if that's like a skill or just a genuine pressure, like being controlled by Dagon is much more intense than being controlled by the Lacubra. How how can Vilgax steal his heart? And how can Dagon even be alive without one? Solid questions. You've never understood anything about us or our mission. I don't think anybody ever has, dude. You guys are the most unorganized and random villains in this whole show that your boss literally had to come down and tell you to get your shit together. Perhaps you've heard the story of St. George and the Dragon. Flashback time. Here is what actually happened. I love storybook sequences. But you can see the book opens up in the middle of the whole story, but it starts with Once Upon a Time. George was a noble knight, defended the helpless wherever he traveled. We got a little hybrid of moving pictures and animation. George right here is pretty fully animated, but here he's just shifting between different frames. It's a very flat art style too, like nobody has any shading, but I think it works. He heard tale of a hideous creature, a dragon. So this is one of Dagon's other forms, and Dagon, Dragon, you know, lay on more confusion. And you can pick this up pretty easily, but they never really explain it. Dagon can shapeshift, but what's confusing is they don't really say it. So when the Esoterica are confused, thinking that Vilgax looks like Dagon, where does like the squid form of him officially come from? Like why is that the staple look for him? Is that his default form, or is that just the only way he's really interacted with the ancestors of the Esoterica in order for them to? be aware of him. And likewise, why is he a dragon right now? If you have, like, universal power, it doesn't matter what you look like, so shape-shifting is kind of obsolete. But yeah, so Dagon decided to look like a dragon right now for an undisclosed reason, and will later shape-shift into a squid for another undisclosed reason. But this is how George remembers him. So George confronted the beast. Is this our first look at Ascalon? Tried to seize control of his mind. Those are Echo Echo's effects right there. He was too strong. Special helmets can help prevent the possession of Dagon, but in his narrative, Driscoll doesn't mention that. He just says George was too strong to be mind controlled. But he was too strong. So I don't think Driscoll knows why George couldn't be possessed, but his helmet putting down is like a hint to the audience the real reason why. That was fully animated. And ironically, this smoke is the only thing to have definition shadows in this whole sequence. Cut out the heart of the beast, and still it would not die. That's pretty badass, not gonna lie. I really like this story. Cast the creature back into the pit from whence it came, and sealed it in. That isn't really explained how he did that either. Does old George know magic, or is this like an additional feature of Ascalon? This kind of just 
happens too. Like, oh yeah, he he sealed him up. He's fine. Good luck figuring out how. So long as the sword pierces the dragon's heart, Dagon cannot regain his full power. I do wonder how they figured that out though, because it seems to me like George tried to kill him by cutting out his heart and it didn't work, but he somehow found out that it makes Dagon not as powerful. In which I don't get why he doesn't just chop the heart up into pieces. Like this is a cool display and all, but I would have just like shredded that shit and like threw a piece of the heart everywhere. Maybe eat some of it. I don't know. Make sure this can never be reobtained ever. We need to protect the heart from Vilgax. We must first find it. Those who had fallen under the dragon spell built a shrine around the heart. Okay, but Dagon can still possess people. I mean, we knew that. Like we've known that since Creature from Beyond. But like with that story, it kind of implies that Dagon doesn't have any powers without the heart. But he can still possess and control the Lacubras, and then from there he can use the Lacubras to possess people and use those people to build a shrine. I guess the heart is more of just a power boost than a source, but Dagon seems pretty capable and efficient even without it. He's just trapped in the seal. Also another note that this is the same seal from Creature from Beyond, but here it's all displayed up on top of what looks like, if not a mountain, at least a hill of some sort, which eventually becomes a cave. So it either sinks into the ground or all the terrain grows around it. And how long ago was this? 17 centuries ago. Is that long enough time for like massive terrain to reform? I truly don't know. It travels between Dagon's world and ours, and it never appears twice in the same place. So a trans-dimensional randomly teleporting fortress. Yeah, that is a good way to keep the heart out of people's hands. But actually thinking further, it seemed like the Lacubras weren't a problem until the Forever Knights tried drilling it open and cracked it and released a Lacubra to possess people. So before the seal was cracked, how did Dagon possess all those people to build this teleporting fortress? I don't know, man. This whole thing is like a lot. Like, I realize, like, not all of it needs to be explained. I'm not really trying to fault the episode for this, because it's just, like, it's nitpicky at this point. But I would personally love to know all of those little details. But I'll bet George knows where to find it. George isn't dead, is he? You talk about him like you know him personally. See, Ben's so perceptive. With him, with Albedo, with Simeon. So on a small tangent to one of my quick reviews, how did Elena fool Ben when pretending to be Julie? Like, Ben's really not that stupid. But sometimes he just randomly is. He's some kind of immortal, right? He cannot die. His life is bound to the sword Ascalon. His life is bound to Ascalon, but later on we'll see him die and Ascalon will stay maintained. Again, just another small inconsistency with like, well, how does that work? Then we'd better find him. These runes are undecipherable. It's just calculus. I guess they don't teach mathematics in the Plumbers or Forever Knights if Driscoll doesn't know what this is. I love that effect. Latitude and longitude for the next place the shrine is going to appear. So these coordinates are real and leads you to Orkney or Orkney, uh, apologies. I'm not sure which one's right. And it's in the Northern Isles of Scotland near the North coast of Great Britain. So George was able to mathematically deduce where the fortress was randomly teleporting. But this won't be the only time we see someone use math to hack magic as Gwen will later create an algorithm to deduce the random magically changing name of the door to anywhere. In fact, maybe she got the idea to mathematically hack magic from George since he did so right here about four hours from now most useful <laughs> uh, man I mean I guess he caught him off guard but that that's still kind of pathetic nice looking little shot here I wonder if that's what Orkney really looks like. Wow, you know what? It's very similar. It even has this weird random rock formation. I love that attention to detail. We must destroy the dragon's heart. There lies the shrine there's his invisible teleporting fortress. I always kind of forget about this whole deal. I like how the outline has this sparkling effect and you do see a weird wobbling texture on the walls. Give it some depth. I think this is the first time we're seeing someone dimensionally shift outside of an esoterica uniform. Ain't no way they're falling for that though. That's awesome. They're so quick about it, too. Instant dodge, and he comes out around here. Smack. Disappears again. Look how well coordinated they are, too. Whoa, what? He's able to catch his blade like that. See, if this wasn't a laser sword, this would be cool. But it's distracting that it's a laser sword, because this should be impractical. Unless you want to say, like, the magic that Dagon gives him allows him to touch lasers. I'll throw it on the power list. Laser touching. That's, that's something. No reaction and just a casual smack of George's fist knocks this guy back. I'm surprised this heart hasn't rotted away by now if it's really just like a disposed organ. Look who's out of his cage. 
This is the smallest we've seen Vilgax in his regular form, and now he's so flat, like a jellyfish. This is pretty awesome. See his arms wrapping around, coiling up as he starts to take his regular shape again. Because he said he was too weak to return to his normal form in the sword or the heart. I don't know which one is doing it, but something's giving him the power. And I like the way they draw Vilgax's structure. I think this is the only time where you truly see Vilgax without any armor, cybernetic enhancements, or clothes, or anything. Okay, it's the sword that was doing it. Incredible. So the first time we see someone wearing Ascalon's armor is Vilgax. I forgot how weird that was. You charlatan! That's what gives it away? When he actually betrays you, only then do you finally see that this is in Dagon. That's a new power. That definitely comes straight from the sword. Now the wiki says that Cyrus and Driscoll die in this episode. Is this that right now? Is this that scene? Because I know all the Forever Knights die by the end of the war, but I forgot if anybody actually dies here. Infinite power awaits. Tell me, you must break the seal. So, Dagon thinks he's manipulating Vilgax, and we'll later find that Vilgax is only playing along to double-cross Dagon. So it seems like they're forming an alliance right now, but they're both planning on betraying each other. Can't. Just get us to the shrine, okay? Gwen is truly traumatized from being possessed by Dagon. It sucks for Gwen, but it's interesting to touch on how much it takes a toll on her and the effects of Dagon's power. It's an indirect way to hype him up once more. You want to talk about it? With all the crazy action, they take a second to have a calm moment between the Tennysons. I'm, I'm really liking the writing of this episode. Everything's flowing together very nicely. I feel sick. Why didn't I fight it? That's like being angry at yourself for catching the flu. It's not your fault. That's very good wording and also a way to be sympathetic while also justifying her feelings. Because he's not just saying like, oh, there's nothing to worry about. It's not your fault. But he's also acknowledging that like it is taking a toll on her. If anybody is to blame for all of this, it's me. The Knights, Vilgax, the Esoteric. Now the dagger. I should have put it all together sooner. Well, to be fair, there is a lot to put together here, but kind of in a good way. Like, the reason I like this arc so much is because it's like you're solving a puzzle. So despite all of my nitpicks and critiques, like, that's just like the intricacies of like all of it. But there is enough information here for you to connect all these pieces. Honestly, it doesn't really matter, like, how Dagon built the teleporting fortress. The story isn't about that. And it doesn't break the story either, whether or not you know how he did it. I see the seal. Vilgax, he's heading for it. Sir George and Triscoll followed him, but they're down. They're all down. She's saying down, not dead. So, like, that could just be taken literal. Like, oh, she just knocked him out for a little bit. But maybe, yeah, it is just, like, a more censored of way saying, like, Vilgax killed all of them. Which is also interesting, because they do say kill in Ben 10. They keep going back and forth on whether or not they're supposed to say kill. Sometimes a villain will be like, I'll destroy you. And then other times they'll say, yeah, we're gonna kill you. Or, oh, I killed him, this and that. It can never seem to make up its mind. You're sure they're at the seal? That's thousands of miles away from where we're headed. Gwen, I need you to teleport us to the seal. Now they're playing up the importance of her teleporting again, which has been a growing thing in Ben 10. Uh, teleportation hangover here. Hold it down. There has been instances where she teleports people and they're fine. But I guess here, after, you know, being possessed by the dag and, and the mental toll it's taking on herself, it's a lot harder to pull off a spell like that. Now she's sick, going a thousand miles an hour, and we're a mile up. With all those factors, I can see why this is more difficult than, like, say, her teleporting them at the end of final battle. We don't really have a choice. What do you mean, we? I can do it, Kevin. Although I do like the intense confrontation. I'm really gonna miss the show taking itself this seriously. Like, I'm not trying to hate on Omniverse before I even get to it, but even moments like this, it'll always be undercut with like the tone or the music choices or the jokes or something like this genuinely feels like it's a hundred percent serious the stakes are high we really don't get that with omniverse maybe like once or twice but even then it's still like a semblance of like that omniverse goofiness i'm just i'm really going to miss this once the show is over i have to it's not just the fact that the characters are being serious and all of that like it plays into the stakes and it plays into the emotional core of these characters. Ben's trying to prioritize the mission at all costs, and he knows he's asking Gwen for something that's going to hurt her and make her uncomfortable. That's why he's sympathetic, and he blames himself, but he still ultimately sees that if they're going to have some type of advantage, he needs to ask this horrible favor of Gwen. And Kevin, who wants to protect Gwen at all costs, is willing to risk the whole mission for the sake of Gwen, and emphasizes Ben's fault in this picture, ignoring that it's also themselves that miss the picture as well. 
See, they're taking time with the scene, they're letting it breathe. They're building up to the dramaticness of the teleportation. Now they've made it all the way to the seal, which was in America, right? It, it must be somewhere far because they were on their way to the UK and now they realize it's too late to turn around, so they have to teleport. That's a different shade of metal that he should be absorbing. This is the shade of metal he would get if he absorbed the regular Forever Knight armor, but not the new and improved one. You have no idea what you're doing! <laughs> Now this was this was kind of a cool moment. Ben gets another randomly new alien. Although he gets immediately smacked. And transforms back. Like ugh, that's that that was a risky move. I feel like I kind of appreciate it because at this point it really shouldn't be a big deal that every single time Ben gets a new alien, we gotta make a whole thing out of it. Like Ben does say he has 63 aliens, so while this might be the Edel's debut for the audience, it doesn't seem like this is Ben's first time turning into Edel. So in the context of the story, like, you know, if this was anybody else other than Edel, it would be fine. I think it's just a bit disappointing for the audience that the first time we see him, he gets, like, immediately KO'd. We don't even get to see what he does. Also, on another side note, I kind of think it was done to show how powerful Vilgax is becoming. Like, Ben busts out a brand new alien, and Vilgax immediately takes it out, without a fight. Like, when you put it that way, it's like Vilgax is flexing on him, but then you actually later on learn who Edel was was, and it's like, was Edel really the right choice for that scene? It's a very love it or hate it kind of moment. Let me know how you feel about Edel's debut down in the comments below. He's doing it. It's another great use of shaky cam without overdoing it. The shadows are moving as well, like rapidly overlapping along with the intense glow. This episode looks really good too. She's forming the shield very slowly. I think this might be because of how weak she is now. Usually she makes those shields like that. Also crazy how it's up to Gwen to save them when she's at such low power, but it's still enough to protect them. That's just a true testament to how powerful Gwen is. Ooh. This isn't just the underside of Vilgax. He's like transforming. I think this might have been him trying to enter his giant form again to protect himself. Cause look how the mouth is now centered in his tentacles rather than like on top of the, the crest of them. Another cool way for Gwen's shield to be disappearing piece by piece with all the cracks. And I love how the dirt kicked up around the shield remains. He got Vilgax to do his dirty work, and now he's taking his heart back to his dimension. Actually, that's a good point. So Vilgax pulled the sword out of the heart, right? But what did happen to the heart? Okay, he pulls the sword out. And the heart disappears? Did it, like, fuse into the sword? That's also not really clear. It's far from hopeless. Here it comes. He feels the sword first, like he's greeting an old friend. It's been so long since he's seen this, he's probably taking it all in that it's finally back and in his hands again. I love the music here too. The transformation is pretty nice. Although you see his fingers click onto this color completely and then grow and bulging up with the knuckles of the armor. You even see the lines slide over. I don't think this was supposed to be completely covered with the metal texture until that was done forming, but it still looks kind of good and the sound effects make it work. So that's- it still works. And now he's young, strong, and heroic. Let the dragon come. Yeah, it's been a bit since I've seen this episode, but I don't remember it being this hype. So much happens in it too. It's almost like a mini movie. Tons of great lore, alien introductions, an epic four-way battle between the Esoterica, the Forever Knights, Vilgax, and the trio, all after their own goals and intermingling right here at the center point of all these different storylines overlapping. I think it's it's brilliant. I think it's perfect. I love it. Although I'm still only going to give the plot a four. I think there's a couple of things that weaken the plot a little bit. One of them being it's very reliant on making sense of all of these different episodes, and normally that would benefit the episode even more. Like War of the Worlds, for example, the fact that it links up to like two seasons worth of setup is what made the payoff really great. But here, because it was multiple storylines overlapping, it's a little bit harder to follow, thus the payoff can come off as more confusing. It's not as airtight as War of the Worlds is what I'm saying. And without making sure you've seen all the important episodes previously, along with making those connections yourself, you might not be able to appreciate it as much. It might just seem like not as great of an episode 
as it is. I think I felt that the first time around, but when you really look at it, this episode is great. Linking all of the pieces together, taking its time to make sure they focus on the characters. They give you a whole George breakdown scene. There's that calm moment on the Rust Bucket 3 between the trio. There's that whole opening scene with the plumbers too, just to set the stage. Normally, if an episode feels rushed or something, or something is less confusing, I look for the scene that I would cut in order to dedicate more time to the important things. And in this scenario, it'd be easy to be like, okay, well, that whole opening sequence with the plumbers and the esoterica. If you cut that, you can focus on other things. But the other things in this episode that we're focused on, I think work. I don't think they need more elaboration. Maybe an extra sentence or two just to really emphasize the teleporting castle. Just because outside of that one establishing shot, it is easy to miss like what's happening there. And then all of a sudden they're back at the cave. Like you might not really be able to make those connections that like that Dagon's castle and the cave are two different locations. Like it's pretty clear when I'm breaking it down like this. I don't know. Maybe I'm looking too deep into this. But I also feel like because of how chaotic it can be, it's not it's not an easy watch. Like it's hard to just throw this episode on and 100% absorb it and enjoy it for everything it is. It's definitely an episode that works because of what the foundation has been laid from the creature from beyond, the flamekeeper circle. The purge of course too, that was an important episode. But with all of those assets, I love this episode. Personally, in my heart, this is a five. But what absolutely gets a five is the characters. Everybody in this episode is written fantastically. There's also a lot of good humor too. And old George is a character too. Like, like, we still don't know a lot about him, but I think the mystery of him is what makes him intriguing. Like, with Conduit Edwards, I would say, we don't know a lot about him, therefore he's boring. With Old George, the fact that we don't know a lot about him makes us want to learn more. And we do learn more in this episode with the whole flashback storybook sequence. And despite it being, you know, kind of the generic tale of Old George and the dragon, within the context of Ben 10, with the way it's connected and rooted into the world, it makes it that much more interesting and that much more important. How Dagon was disguising himself as that dragon originally, and the heart is where Ascalon is embedded, which unlocks George's full potential too. So Dagon's full potential and George's full potential are sealed away in that fortress. Give George the sword, he is young and powerful again. Give Dagon the heart, he can take over the universe. It's like, it's interesting. It's very different from what Ben 10 normally does. And in this regard, it works. Because again, the foundation, we've been seeing the Forever Night since classic series, so it doesn't feel like as random. Visuals is a solid five. The artwork, the animation, and the choreography are all on point. Love the multiple locations too. Love the way the esoterica works. Love the tensions in the scenes and the emotions of the characters and the way they're animated. All great. Importance is a solid five. We're at the grand middle point of the whole Dagon arc and I'm really loving how it's unfolding here. Entertaining. I know a lot of people had a harder time vibing with the story because of all the confusing elements. Not to mention the Forever Knights aren't everyone's favorite enemies. They certainly aren't my but this art redeems their interest. And also, you know, despite Fast Track and Edel being in here, it's still kind of frustrating that they're just kind of shoved to the side and a little distracting. Also, there is quite a bit of lore dumping in here, and if you're not into that, then it's probably gonna come off a little bit more boring than normal. I'm very excited for the next episode, which directly picks up where this one leaves off. But for now, let's tackle the final thoughts. So I got two quick corrections from the last full breakdown. I did forget to include the Rust Bucket 3 being destroyed in the vehicle repair counter. It's been corrected in the last two quick reviews, but I figured I'd mention it here too. My bad. Hopefully it won't happen again. And also while I mentioned that Ben was previously inside the Omnitrix in the episode Max Out when he was trying to cure his cousin Ken, I also forgot to mention that he was also inside of the Omnitrix in Destroy All Aliens, which created multiple simulations very similar to the one that the Ultimatrix created when Ben was sucked in in the Ultimate Sacrifice. But a question about this episode, I'm not exactly sure how Gwen and the trio knew that Dragon and Dagon were the same? How long have you been in Esoterica? A follower of Dagon. The Dragon. Where we last leave off their knowledge of the Dagon, they don't even believe he's real. But in this episode, not only do they have no reaction to him being real, they also seem to already know that the Dragon from long ago was Dagon. I was searching through and I really don't know when they made that connection. I think the writers were all caught up with all these different elements they have to introduce. They didn't realize they never actually made the trio officially aware of all of this. They just seem to kind of know by now. And it's very easy to miss. I didn't even pick this up the first couple of times I saw it, but it is 
is a little bit strange, but I guess they can't learn everything on screen. But if anything, I would have at least liked a reaction where they find out Dagon is officially real. Anyways, from last week's poll, it seemed like the majority vote for your favorite moment from that episode was Ben's sacrifice. And I have to agree. I do think Kevin's speech resonates in my head a little bit more just because it was like specific wording, but Ben's ultimate choice to sacrifice himself for the ultimates is definitely one of the best moments for Ben's character. Super memorable, and I'm very happy we got it in the show. For this week's poll, since there's so many different sides to the storyline, which side of the story are you enjoying the most so far? Old George on his quest to rematch the Dagon. Dagon using Vilgax as his new pawn in his grand scheme. The Esoterica still on their quest to be loyal servants to the Dagon. Or none of it, and you just enjoy the side stories in Ultimate Alien Season 3. Let me know what you think in the community tab when this video goes live. I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your weekend. And as always, keep it fizzy. Yeah.